I remember when we first arrived at the airport in New York, how tight my mother's hand felt in mine. How her mouth became stiff when the uniformed man split open the packing tape around our suitcase and plunged his hands into her underwear and saris, making us feel dirty inside. Abba's leg was jiggling a little, which is what it does when he's nervous. Even then we were afraid because we knew we were going to stay past the date on the little blue stamp of the tourist visa in our passports. Everyone does it. You buy a fake social security number for a few hundred dollars and then you can work. A lot of the Bangladeshis here are illegal, they say. Some get lucky and win the diversity lottery so they can stay. Once we got here, Abba worked all kinds of jobs. He sold candied nuts from a cart on the streets of Manhattan. He worked on a construction crew until he smashed his kneecap. He swabbed down lunch counters, mopped a factory floor, bussed dishes in restaurants, delivered hot pizzas in thick silver nylon bags. Then Abba began working as a waiter in a restaurant on East 6th Street in Manhattan. 6th Street is lined with Indian restaurants each a narrow basement room painted in bright colors and strung with lights, with some guy playing sitar in the window. They're run by Bangladeshis, but they serve all the same Indian food, chicken tandoori and biryani, what the Americans like. Every night, Abba brought home wads of dollars that Ma collected in a silk bag she bought in Chinatown. The thing is, We've always lived this way, floating, not sure where we belong. In the beginning, we lived so that we could pack up any day, fold up all our belongings into the same nylon suitcases. Then, over time, Abba relaxed. We bought things. A fold-out sofa where Ma and Abba could sleep. A TV and a VCR. A table and a rice cooker. Yellow ruffle curtains and clay pots for the chili peppers. A pine bookcase for Aisha's math and chemistry books. Soon, it was like we were living in a dream of a home. Year after year we went on, not thinking about Abba's expired passport in the dresser drawer, or how the heat and the phone bills were in a second cousin's name. You forget. You forget you don't really exist here, that this really isn't your home. One day, we said, we'd get the paperwork right. In the meantime, we kept going. It happens. All the time. Even after September 11, we carried on. We heard about how bad it had gotten. Friends of my parents had lost their jobs or couldn't make money, and they were thinking of going back. Though, like my father, they sold their houses in Bangladesh and had nothing to go back to. We heard about a man who had one side of his face bashed in and another who was run off the road in his taxi and called bad names. Still, people kept coming for Porus and Alu Gobi on 6th Street. Still, Abba emptied his pockets every night into Ma's silk bag. Abba used to say, In a bad economy, people want cheap food, especially cheap food with chili peppers that warms their bellies. But things got worse. We began to feel as if the air had frozen around us trapping us between two jagged ice flows. Each bit of news was like a piece of hail flung at us, stinging our skins. Homeland Security. Patriot Act Code Orange. Special Registration. Names. So many names of Muslims called up on the rosters. Abba had a friend who disappeared to a prison cell in New Jersey. We heard of hundreds of deported Iranians from California and others from Brooklyn, Texas, upstate New York. We watched the news of the war and saw ourselves as others saw us. Dark, flitting shadows, grenades blooming in our fists. Dangerous. Then one day my cousin Tazlima's American boyfriend came over and explained the new special registration law. Every man over 18 from certain Muslim countries had to register. Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Some did and were thrown in jail or kicked out of the country. More and more we heard about the people fleeing to Canada and applying for asylum there instead of going into detainment. Abba's friends came over in twos and threes. 
Ma served them sweets and ducha, milky tea, and they'd talk about starting again in the cold country up north, a new life. The Canadians are friendly, they like to say. There comes a time, Abba said grimly, when the writing is right there on the wall. Why should we wait for them to kick us out? He added, I want to live in a place where I can hold my head up. One evening, Abba came into our bedroom, a quiet, sad look on his face. Take that down, he said to Aisha. He was pointing to her Britney Spears poster, the only one she was allowed. Ma opened the closets and folded all her saris and shalwar kameezes into the nylon suitcases we used when we came here. We could tell no one, not even our best friends at school, what we were doing. Abba asked me to bring out my map of the Northeast. After I laid the map open on the dining table, Abba showed us the thick arteries of highways, the spidery blue line of the border. There, he said. We have to go there and apply for asylum. I swallowed, my throat very dry. What happens if they don't let us in? I kept thinking. The next morning, we woke to a scraping and coughing noise and saw the blue Honda by the curb. Chapter 2 By the time we get on the road again, the day is in full swing. Tractor trailers are roaring out of the lot, and there's a pink tinge to the sky. It looks like more snow, though, up ahead when we turn onto the highway. We can see the gray clouds massed on the horizon. When Abba cracks open the window, icy wind slices across my cheek. We go silent in the car. This is the last stretch, past the signs for bass shoe outlets and cigarettes sold cheap. We're going to leave the main highway soon and stop at the immigration station on the border between Vermont and Canada and tell them we're asking for asylum. We'll fill out some forms, and it will take a long time, but then they'll let us go to the other side. The landscape here is different. Clapboard houses with slanted roofs, church spires, white column buildings. I'd always heard about New England. At the college office in our high school, there are lots of catalogs, with the kids sitting on lawns in front of buildings like this. When I see those pictures, I want to press myself inside just like I want to go to Disney World and Las Vegas and play the slot machines, though Ma would freak. One day, I was watching The Simpsons, and they did this really funny show about Epcot Center. But I can't even laugh at places like that, because first, I have to go there. Then I can laugh and be sort of above it all. That's how you can tell the immigrant kids from the ones born here. We don't laugh about those places. We just want to go. The road has turned foggy. The trees sweep past in a wet blur. Abba's driving very slow, hunched over the wheel, trying to peer through the windshield. We pass a sign, leaving the United States of America. I see Abba's hand pause as he grabs his chest, rubbing. It hurts, this leaving. We weren't supposed to do this. We were supposed to stay. And then one day, roll the word in our mouths. Home. Every inch the car moves forward, the word seems to crack, crushed under our tires. Our car slows, and we see four, no, seven, no, maybe a dozen cars ahead of us. Around the bend, a greyhound bus is letting out lots of people. Men in long white kurtas knit scarves around their necks, and women whose shawar kameezes stick out from their sweaters. Everyone is stamping their feet in the cold. Just beyond is a low brick building, the red and white Canadian flag snapping on a pole. A tall man in a brown uniform and hat is moving toward us, waving his gloved hand. Slowly, Abba lets down the window. Officer, sir, he asks. The tip of the man's nose is rosy red, and he's got gingery freckles all over his cheeks. Passports. He says it as if he knows not to bother. We are applying for asylum in your country, sir, Abba replies. Ma is leaning forward to the left so sharply I think she's going to fall into Abba's lap. The man shakes his head 
droplets spattering off the brim of his hat. Sorry, we're full up here. Overwhelmed. People have been coming non-stop, and we can't process them all. We're still swallowing down the cold, unable to speak. I can see Ma's eyes start to crinkle and turn shiny wet. But, sir, we can drive to another post. You just tell me where. He shakes his head again. I can see it is a friendly move. He looks sorry to have to say no. Everywhere. Detroit. All the border crossings. It's been crazy these past few weeks. No one says a word. I can hear Ma crying very quietly. From the back, Aisha pipes up. What do you recommend? The man takes her in. A 17-year-old girl with coal smudged around her eyes and her frizzy black hair spilling around her parka hood. She's wearing a Destiny's Child t-shirt and jeans Ma always says are too tight on her. The best thing you can do is go back around the American side. I'm afraid they'll probably arrest you if your visa isn't current. Here he looks at Abba, who is staring dully at the windshield. My guess is it won't be all of you. I hear they're asking for around $5,000 bond. If you put that together, you can come back in a few weeks and try to apply for asylum again. Abba is squeezing the steering wheel. Open, shut, open, shut. Just like the massage exercises he did after he got hurt on his construction job, he's hunched over, still as a rock, as if he can't make himself move. Sir? Still, Abba doesn't answer. Sir, if you could just turn the car around that way. Slowly, Abba puts the car into reverse.